delighted to have our second uh, Lunch and Learn now um, in partnership with Auckland Genomics and 10X. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to take up too much time. Uh, I will pass now to Nikki Freed, who's the lead technologist at Auckland Genomics. Uh, then we'll go to Yvonne Peterman from uh, 10X Genomics to talk specifically about the um, sample prep for um, cancer and immunology cells. And then we'll go on to um, Alicia and Joanna to talk about their research, which, yeah, so it's going to be really exciting and sorry. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, I started screen sharing a bit early, but anyway, uh, I just wanted to say um, we're really excited to hear our own University of Auckland researchers talking about the work that they're doing um, in uh, single cell sequencing. <clears throat> I just wanted to just briefly just say a little plug for Auckland Genomics. We're um, one of the core sequencing facilities at the University of Auckland. We offer um, 10x sequencing, so single cell sequencing. Um, we're in the Science Center there, and we have a friendly team of people to help with all of your sequencing needs. Um, yeah, so just get in touch. The best way is to just email us at Auckland Genomics and I'd be happy to take any questions in the chat if people, and I'd like to just hear if people have projects they wanna do um, with 10X with single cell. That's why I think a lot of people are logging on today to hear more about how it might impact their work or how they can use this technology. So I'd be happy to help anybody with that. Um, yeah, so I don't wanna take any more time. I will stop sharing. So I, I, yeah, I don't want to take too much time away from the, from the um, researchers' presentations today, which I'm also super excited about. Um, yep. So I wanted to take this time uh, to give you uh, some tips and tricks around sample preparation, specifically for oncology and immunology type samples. Uh, so for, for single cell, for any single cell experiment, you know, there is quite a few uh, considerations there that may be different uh, to, to you know, any other essay you may be familiar with running. Uh, so we've picked a few of these tips and tricks in, in a few slides here. Uh, and hopefully, you know, that that is going to be useful for you in the interest of time. Um, it, it's not probably as detailed as we, we could be, you know, there's a lot more you can talk about. So please, if there's anything in there uh, that you see that you go, yep, that's exactly what I'm doing and I need to know more, just get in touch with us. Um, and, and we can always, you know, either have a separate conversation or, or um, send you more um more details. So I guess, um, you know, one of the first questions I actually had from the audience that we have here today, you know, if you could just put up your, your hand, you don't have to say anything uh, as such, but, you know, have you actually, are you currently preparing single cell um, suspensions or nuclei suspensions for um, a single cell experiment? So, you know, are you doing this already or are you in the process of of optimizing uh, this kind of experiment, that, that would be quite interesting to hear. So, you know, if, you, if you're happy to, to show a hand if you are, um, and if no one is, then I guess, you know, hopefully you take away some information uh, from today. Uh, so just quickly, um, the, the different readouts that you can get from our essays, you know, sort of define uh, the type of input that you want to use. So whether we do the three prime gene expression kit, the immune profiling kit, or whether you are planning on doing CRISPR screening or chromatin, um, you know, uh, chromatin accessibility epigenetic studies. So each of these will um, have you decide, will need, will have you decide whether you go with nuclei cells and any of these other feature barcode uh, tagged input materials. Uh, so I've shown this last in the last session already that there is sort of, you know, that upfront decision, what am I measuring um, and what input does it require? So, you know, if you want to do protein expression and RNA, you have to use whole cells. If you're just using or interested in RNA uh, gene expression, you can use whole cells or nuclei. Um, you know, but if you're doing chromatin accessibility, this essay actually requires nuclei input. <clears throat> and then obviously you can actually run this decision process backwards. So sometimes you actually don't have anything other than nuclei you can use. And from there, you know, you can sort of decide or you, you're a bit limited in terms of what you can capture. So with nuclei, for example, you know, you can't detect cell surface proteins. Um, antigen um, reactions, etc. So that's just sort of a, at a high level. 
And when you um, look at the sample preparation uh, workflow planning steps, uh, which we have listed out here, there is, you know, the blue arrows, if you wish, they are sort of mandatory, you have to do those. And then anything in between is one of those things that you need to, you know, uh, assess for your own uh, sample accessibility, transport requirements, etc. And those will be um, optional as well as the sample enrichment or depletion steps that won't always um, be necessary. So, you know, these key considerations here are also quite important uh, to keep in mind what organisms uh, are you working with? Is it always human um, or are you working with um, model organisms or with cell lines, organoids, etc.? Um, so which specific tissue or cell types um, are you interested in and then how will you be generating these? And that's important because for single cell experiments, we have these um, sample requirements that are, that are quite high. So we want to go in with cell viabilities. Uh, being extremely high, and now we are saying at um, higher or greater than 70%, but really you want this to be higher than that. So we are looking at 90% or more if you can. We are looking at, you know, healthy cells um, with no RNA leakage, no RNA degradation to obtain the crisp data sets that you are after. You know, those cells need to be intact. Um, so that, that means you want to um, prevent any physical decomposition working quick working on ice and then also you know um make sure you don't have any aggregates or clumping in your in your suspension uh, no subcellular debris or uh, free floating rna dna which all can um not only influence you know how we form the the, the droplets the gems on the instrument but then obviously also your, your data sets downstream so specifically uh, for oncology research, um, we have uh, put this um, table together here where you, where you can check, you know, where do you start? What kind of starting material do you have? Do you have a uh, solid uh, starting material like a tumor biopsy or, or even post-mortem post tissue? Are you working with whole blood? Um, so that's obviously, you know, for a whole range of different uh, areas applicable as, you know, immunology as well, or you're working with um, BMAs. And then, um, you know, you go through uh, the different collection um, processes or the different recommendations for that. So for blood, it's important, you know, you, sh you can't freeze this or you shouldn't freeze it. Um, you, you work with specific collection containers. Uh, we do actually have... Um, a uh, validated protocol available that shows exactly what we have actually validated, what collection tubes are validated, and which ones could be uh, are compatible with our workflow. And, um, and then you look at, you know, specific storage and transportation conditions uh, that you, you have to adhere to, to uh, keep these cells uh, viable. Um, so whether, you know, you can ship this at room temperature of four degrees, uh, if that's the case, then you have to, you know, sort of stay within 24 hours of collection to handling. And um, if you do uh, need to cryopreserve or actually have the ability to cryopreserve on site, uh, those cells need to be isolated first and then cryopreserved. So there's a few um, steps involved in the, the preparation of cells derived from a liquid um, biopsy from a liquid sample. Um, so cell I isolation uh, using radians is an option when you work with PVMCs, for example, and we, we would certainly recommend that twice, you know, to, to uh, remove red blood, cell, red blood cells um, efficiently. Um, I have one slide um, or a couple of slides later on. If you do work with organoids, how to specifically handle those and dis dissociate those into single cells. Um, there is specific sort of enzyme cocktails that have been published, uh, depending on the type of organoid you're working with. And then um, also for these uh, tissue biopsies uh, or, or tumor samples, um, again, you know, there is different ways of collecting this and I have actually a, a little graphic that, that we can go through in a second that shows you then that sort of the decision tree which way or what are you able to um, uh, look at or isolate from these tissue types depending on the storage um, capabilities that you have at time of collection. 
So here I just wanted to highlight this protocol, this demonstrator protocol that I just mentioned for cell isolation from blood products for single cell assays. Uh, it is available on the support site, but again, I'll, I can send it through um, for ease of use. Um, we do have this uh, validated on whole blood and bone marrow aspirates. And we, as I mentioned, you know, we have a list of validated blood collection tubes and anticoagulants in this um, document. So you can, um, you know, double check if it's compatible uh, with 10X. So here uh, for this specific um, protocol, there is three entry points in this demonstrated protocol, sort of three um, um, starting points and depending on you know whether you start um, with a whole blood in a collection tube and whether you are interested in um, getting a leukocytes or looking at leukocytes or if you want to um, extract PBMCs it defines um, your workflow steps um, to actually end up with these resuspended cells of interest. So again uh, that's the high level graphic but uh, the details are listed in the in the protocol how, how to actually um, do these. For the organoids uh, specifically, it's a very similar workflow. You take your organoid culture, uh, you digest the organoid using these specific enzymes um, to create the single cell suspension. Most likely there will be washing um, steps involved. You just always have to keep in mind every single washing step means uh, you're losing cells. And it also means that you are putting um, a little bit more stress on the cells um, and, uh, you know, you want to minimize those washing steps as much as you can, while at the same time, remove the debris um, as well. So the incubation times for these uh, to perform the enzymatic uh, digestion process will need to be optimized in most cases. Um, and this is the table I mentioned earlier. We do have some guidelines on this. Uh, and this is backed by some of the references where this was used uh, for the different organoid types, uh, specific cell densities, and then what kind of enzymes are used. And these publications here specifically highlight, you know, some of the timings uh, that were applied to uh, obtain these single cell suspensions successfully. Um, not sure if anyone in the audience is working with organoids or uh, considering to use organoids. Maybe, um, yeah, you can put your hand up as well. Again, uh, it would be interesting for us to know um, if anyone here is working with organoids. <clears throat> yeah, just feel free to unmute, your, mute, unmute yourself and say yes or no, uh, just because there's no, um, that, that you put your hand up in a um, Zoom meeting rather than webinar. Again, if that's something that's coming up for you, if that's on your radar, you know, if your organoid of interest is not on the list, uh, just please get in touch with us. We also have, um, you know, additional resources to get that information. So for tissue collection, um, from specifically for clinical samples, this is uh, quite an important um, sort of consideration decision tree. Uh, for you in terms of when you get these tissues and what on site is the capability of preservation. So in some cases, you will be able to actually perform, um, you know, direct tissue cryopreservation. Uh, so not just snap freezing, actual cryopreservation, um, in which case you will be allowed or you will be able to obtain cells um, uh, later on uh, in a specific dis dissociation um, protocol or um, that you perform on the tissue if on site when the when the tissue is collected um, you know the um, the tissue specimen can be put in a specific tissue preservation uh, solution and then stored at four degrees for example as well in this case uh, you will be able to uh, extract or ob obtain a single cell um, suspension from those kinds of tissues just keep in mind you know you will you do have a limited um a time uh, so short-term storage you have limited time so you typically less than 72 hours to do um the extraction process but at least it allows you to transport the tissue from the point of collection uh to your laboratory 
And then in some cases, uh, the tissue uh, will be put in a, in a tube and then just snap frozen into liquid di uh, nitrogen directly. If that's the case, and that's your only option, um, you can't extract sort of intact uh, cells from this kind of um, a cryo, uh, uh, preserved tissue, uh, you will only be able to extract nuclei um, in this from this kinds of tissues. And that, as, as we mentioned earlier, that does mean you can still obtain uh, three prime or five prime gene expression from these kinds of samples. You can do a TAC um, or a Martiome um, uh, chromatin accessibility studies, you know, but you won't be able to, to look at any cell surface protein interactions um, or antigen specificity testing. Um, some of the uh, resources here for tissue dissociation we have listed. Um, so again, it's either Nikki or myself can, uh, can point you to those. We can also send you the slides if you prefer that. Um, so you can pick um, the correct protocol or guidelines for each of these different types of uh, tissues that, are, that you are collecting. Each of those is always um, you know, upfront starting with a section of tips and tricks and best practices to really point um, point you into the um, uh, to the critical points in, in a workflow and how to best um, navigate through them to obtain viable um, cell suspensions. Um, we have a tumor dissociation for single cell RNA sequencing protocol with a you know with a um, detailed instructions on how to do, um, how to take your tumor, wash it first, and then take it through these different steps. Again, um, there is also uh, commercially available tumor dissociation kits out there and automated dissociators. Um, so if you are interested in using those, or if you, you now need to see how this goes for specific tissue types, um, there's a number of publications out there. <clears throat> Uh, you know, highlighting the, the use of these kinds of kits. So the same key steps that we use for cells, extracting cells and tissues um, uh, applies when you isolate nuclei. Um, you do, there is a few different QC steps uh, once you have your nuclei. Um, and we are looking here at a lysis efficiency. So we, we start actually by lysing the cells. And um, we need to me make sure that the, the cells are not overlyzed and that the nuclei are still in a, in a healthy uh, shape and not distorted or the membrane uh, deformed. Uh, so that middle section here of this uh, kind of, uh, of, this, of these workflows, depending on you know, starting the cells or tissue, they will need um, optimization most likely. And what you're looking for is uh, just shown briefly here in these two slides. You are looking at um, cell lysis efficiency. You want to see very few um, intact cells remaining. So down here is what, um, what we don't want to see. We want to see most of the cells lysed and no clumps in the, in the suspension. And then we, want, we are looking at uh, cell nuclei that look uh, like picture A or B, so intact and healthy. And um, if in some cases, you know, you're performing all these steps and you're being as careful as possible, um, but your sample, uh, for example, is not necessarily meeting the criteria that we are giving, uh, there is ways of improving uh, the sample quality by uh, choosing um, additional enrichment or cleanup steps. And those steps will be different depending on uh, your sample types and depending on, you know, whether a specific uh, wash step is sufficient or whether you may actually have to do an active dead cell removal um, step using uh, bead kits or using you know specific um, commercially available products. So um, here is a list of some of these sample cleanup techniques and methods and what they actually do um, and what they remove. Uh, and whether they are harsh or uh, thorough or whether, you know, they are taking cells uh, out of your sample type or, or are more designed to remove debris, etc. Uh, so we, you know, I can't go through all of this in detail, just be taken out of this, of this table. And when you come to the point of where you have to decide, um, we can, you know, we can provide you all these, these different protocol examples here uh, to guide you through. 
Um, same, you know, with thawing and washing of dissociated tumor cells, uh, as from the graphic I showed earlier, when you collect the sample and you um, dis dissociate the cells and then freeze them, then how to specifically actually thaw them and perform some of these cleanup and washing steps um, to obtain your um, clear um, single cell suspension. And here we have uh, just some data that show how efficient this washing and a gentle centrifugation step actually can be, uh, where you can increase the cell viability of your uh, suspension um, quite dramatically uh, by, by performing these steps. So you can do um, dead cell removal by uh, using separation methods. So magnetic beads, for example, that, ex that recognize the specific moieties expressed on apoptotic epipt cells. Um, you can use those in an abundant sample of uh, poor cell viability uh, to remove large debris um, prior to dead cell depletion to avoid uh, clogging of, um, of the, the chip. There are some examples of where this has been used, um, application notes, and um, how, uh, you know, what kind of sample data you can get, even if you do start with poor uh, cell viability. And, um, and then you have uh, magnetic bead enrichment, which works on antibody uh, conjugated magnetic beads, as well as a, as a technique to enrich um, or improve your, uh, your cell viability. For um, CD3 positive T cells from dissociated tissues, again, from various uh, dissociated tissues here, we've used these magnetic beads and you can see you now the improvement that's um, achieved utilizing this product. And then of course you can do fax sorting, um, you know, when you're interested in very specific cell types and you want to move and move undesired cells that probably are, you know, the majority of cells that it would take up your, your sequencing data. Um, and in this case, you know, fax sorting is uh, definitely the method of choice uh, to enrich uh, for rare cell types, for example, and clean up debris at the same time. And the last couple of slides, and now we are sort of at, at 20 minutes now, I'll just, uh, just flick through these quickly. We, um, without going through all the specifics in the slides, but we have uh, very specific guidelines uh, on how to extract leukocytes from blood products, for example, um, specifically what to watch out for um, and what key modifications uh, we have to also do when we do the cell, um, when we do the analysis. Um, later on. So for example, for neutrophil detection, there is a few because they are, uh, they have low gene expression and they retain their introns at very high levels. We just have to make a few modifications in the cell ranger pipeline to uh, improve the data analysis um, for this type of cell. And then um, we have, you know, when you look at neutro neutrophils specifically, uh, just recently come out with a specific extraction protocol, demonstrated protocol as well. Uh, you know, just a key point here, we work at room temperature, uh, don't uh, do ice or freezing, so avoid those and then isolate leukocytes as soon as possible after collection. Uh, again, you know, we have the demonstrated protocol here that we can, we can provide and the best uh, sample preparation practices when you work with these granulite samples, um, granulo granulocyte samples are listed here on this slide. That's basically taking whole blood and process as soon as you can. Don't freeze whole blood or isolated cells because it will lyse the granulocytes. Work at room temperature. Uh, again, you know, to avoid that lysis and follow the, uh, the protocols specifically. Use uh, RNAs inhibitor in the cell suspensions because the granulocytes are quite rich in RNAs. And um, here, you know, when we have uh, we have uh, accumulated or we've put together all these considerations in the protocols, so we, you know, we really uh, suggest you follow these um, these recommendations to obtain the most uh, efficient um, extraction or cell suspension from these kinds of. Um, sample types to obtain granulocytes, um, neutrophils, etc. 
And this is just at high level what uh, sample prep workflow for rare cell populations um, can look like. So this is obviously quite involved in terms of using also some antibodies um, to you for for uh, flow cytometry, dextromere panels. So this is quite, you know, involves a few upfront steps. So just when we consider those kinds of things, just remember that all this takes time when you handle your sample and it can actually really, um, um, you know, in, in impact your sample in a way that, you know, you have a lot of cell death, uh, you have a lot of, you're losing a lot of cells in this process as well. So it's always a bit of a trade-off and uh, going through all these steps um, and uh, losing cells. So sometimes if you're actually working with um, very few cells uh, to start with, you know, uh, you are limited in, in these kinds of upfront steps as well of what you can do. Um, with that, I'll stop. Um, I can take questions now. Uh, you can also pop them in the question and answer box. Um, or in the chat, uh, so I can I can try and answer them as we go uh, through the next uh, talks, or uh, follow up, get in touch with um, myself or Elena um, to send you some more details. So thanks, and I'll pass on now to the uh, to the next presenter. Yeah, thanks, Yvonne. Yeah, we'll pass now um, on to. Uh, Joanna and Alicia, thank you so much. Um, I did just, oh, actually, sorry, I'll just quickly do a bit of a, a quiz. We'll see how this goes um, with the people interested in the prizes. Um, so if you can just put it in the, um, the chat box. Um, yeah, can you, can you use nuclei for 10x gene expression? Well, yeah, can you use nuclei as a sample? Yeah. <laughs> Really hard one. Uh, cool, Ash, I'll be in touch um, as to uh, what prize you want. Um, yeah, and so yes, delighted to um, introduce Joanna Mathy and Alicia Disbury um, from University of Auckland to talk about um, their combinational approach here of whole exome, whole genome, and 10 single cell um, for neo antigen discovery. So yeah, away you ladies go, thanks so much. And thanks for the introduction and thanks so much for um, inviting us to do this talk today. Um, Oh yeah, here we go. Um, so Joanna and I have been working on this project together and there's been a lot of other people involved um, in, in the whole um, project, but we thought that it was an excellent opportunity to demonstrate how we applied the single cell seq technology to inform our therapeutic uh, neophyto pipeline. So rather than just presenting on a project where the sole aim of it was single cell seq, we thought that we'd share with you the wider context, um, which unfortunately for some of you uh, means that we're gonna go into the depths of tumor immunology. Um, so I'm gonna cover some of the background in the first part of the talk uh, and Joanna will discuss the nitty gritty sequencing part. Um, so we all know that cancer is a significant health burden with 9.9 .9 million deaths in 2020 and estimates of new cancers doubling over the next 20 years. And there's been a lot of progress made in therapeutics over the last decade or so, but overall for most cancers, five-year survival rates remain reasonably low. And there's an increasing need to implement alternative treatments um, to help improve in, uh, outcomes. Um, so the importance of the immune system and cancer outcomes has long been recognized. And in recent years, immunotherapy has moved to the forefront of cancer treatment. But what is cancer immunotherapy? So really simply, it's the harnessing or redirection of the immune response against the tumor. Immunotherapy relies on the unique ability of the adaptive system to distinguish between self and non-self. And in the case of cancer, this means differentiating between tumor and healthy tissue. Um, the immune system is able to traffic around the body to distance metastases, and it's also able to form immunological memory which leads to a durable anti-tumor response. So generally, we can split the therapies into two broad categories, um, an indirect or non-specific, um, and this seeks to globally target the immune system. So it, this is by the addition of cytokines to try and activate um, a strong immune response or 
by releasing immune suppression, such as with checkpoint blockade. The other way um, that therapies can work is with a more targeted approach, and this directs the immune system to specific tumor antigens. And examples of these are therapeutic vaccines, um, CAR T cells, neoantigen therapy. So adoptive immunotherapy is a form of targeted um, immune therapy. And the broad principle is that we collect or harvest patient cells either from the blood or from the tumour. Um, we expand the immune component of this um, in the lab and we try and specifically expand cells that will be targeted to the tumour. Once these have been expanded to a therapeutically relevant number, we then aim to reinfuse these back into the patient where um, they should home to the tumour and mediate an anti-tumour response. Now, conceptually, this is reasonably straightforward. We're just taking the immune system, growing it up and putting it back in. But um, in, in practice, the targeting of the immune system to the tumour is much more complicated. And um, so target antigens fall within a range of classes. Um, and one of the classes is a tumor associated protein. These are often lineage specific. So they're proteins that were expressed by the lineage cell and then are continued to be expressed by the tumor cell. Um, good examples of this are melan A and melanoma. Um, they could also be germline antigens. So these are proteins that are usually only expressed um, either during embryonic development or within the testes, which is immune privilege. And then that, but these are subsequently re-expressed by the tumor. And then the last type of um, tumor antigen is considered tumor specific. These are peptides which are formed due to genomic mutations within the tumor. And these are entirely absent from the normal human genome. So these peptides, which are derived from endogenous cytosolic proteins, are presented on the surface of the cell within an MHC molecule. And you can see my little, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, actually. Yeah, we can. You can? Yeah. So uh, presented within, within the context of an MHC molecule. And these are recognized by the T cell receptor on a cytotoxic T cell. Oh, no, now I can't move my slide. There we go. <laughs> so neoantigens are specific and they occur as a result of somatic mutations within the tumor genome. This results in the recognition of these peptides as foreign. And the advent of next gen sequencing has provided us with an opportunity to predict these tumor specific mutations by comparing an individual's genome with the cancer exome. This subsequently paves the way for bespoke cancer immunotherapy. Now, more recently, clinical data supports the fact that neoantigens are of particular relevance to, con to tumor control. And indeed, a patient's immune response to the unique mutations present in their own tumor is directly related to their survival. So what attributes would be, our, would, would be contained within our ideal neoantigen? So they need to be able to bind to the MHC class molecule. They need to be sufficiently different from the host epitope, so different from, from the non-tumor genome. And they need to be widely expressed by the tumor. Um, if they're not widely expressed or if they're only expressed on a small portion of the tumor, then tumor escape is, uh, is gonna happen. Um, and they need to be vital to tumor survival or linked to genes that are important to tumor survival. So if we target a gene that, that's absolutely useless in, in the tumor survival, then it can just be downregulated and you'll get tumor escape again. Um, so there are two physical characteristics which we take into account when selecting our neoantigens. And one is the ability, like I said, of the peptide to bind within the MHC group. Hydrophobic residues at the anchor positions determine the peptide binding, and amino acid substitutions at these sites could either increase or decrease the likelihood of the peptide to bind within the molecule, and then that in turn affects the ability of the immune system to recognize it. So you can envision um, 
a situation where the wild type doesn't have an anchor residue um, or doesn't have a hydrophobic residue at the anchor point, but the mutated peptide does. And so therefore suddenly you can see this, um, this peptide. Um, the second consideration is the epitope that is recognized by the T cell. So once the peptide is anchored within the MHC molecule, it bulges slightly, and this bulge is what dictates the immunological specificity. So again, mutations within this region may alter the ability of the T cell to recognize the peptide, or it may recognize it with a higher affinity. I keep losing my mouse, sorry. There we go. <laughs> okay, so on with our approach. Um, so we were lucky enough to have experience with tissue digest because it's something that's been piloted in our lab quite frequently um, for other projects. Um, so, so that made it a little bit easier in terms of, of how we dealt with our bulk tissue. So our patient is, is an older male with stage three melanoma. Um, he had a palpable mass removed from the side of his neck and it was determined later on to be a tumor infiltrated lymph node. So we received a segment of the tumor as well as blood sample, um, and we processed it for various downstream analyses. We assigned um, some of the tissue for bulk imaging, which you'll see a little bit of later. Um, and then we also sectioned bulk tumor for RNA analysis and DNA analysis. And then the remaining tissue we digested enzymatically for single cell suspension. And this is, this is where we ran into probably our first issue. And this is, this is where the single cell um, sequencing really um, took on a shine for us. So what, what you can see from the previous slide is that this is a large amount of um, normal healthy tissue and then embedded in there are small pockets of the melanoma, which is pigmented in this instance. Um, and indeed, when we sectioned it and imaged it, we could see that actually the tumor cells only make up 10% of the total tumor mass. Um, and this actually became a huge issue for us when it came to our whole genome sequencing, because only 10% of the genome could be dedicated to the tumor. And that made calling um, or neoantigen prediction, um, it, it, it reduced our confidence in, in the prediction. Um, so this is when we decided to go with our single cell approach. Um, and so we took our excised tumor and we enzymatically digested it into our single cell suspension. Um, and this was frozen and stored. Um, and, and this was done within 24 hours of our sample collection. Um, when we were ready to take the big step of making our um, 10X libraries, which was reasonably stressful, I might add, um, we thawed ourselves and stained them and proceeded to use our flow cytometry suite to sort just our, our tumor fraction. Um, and again, we're lucky enough within our lab to have expertise in this area. Um, Anna Brooks had already done a trial run with um, sorting cells for single cell. And so we had a good idea about how to proceed. But again, it was, it was reasonably fraught and we had multiple trigger points where we would say, no, no, we're not gonna carry on at each point. Um, but we managed to get through it and we sorted ourselves based on, um, based on the size of the cells, based on whether they were alive or not, and whether they expressed uh, a, an immune marker or a stromal marker. Um, and from that, we managed to extract a reasonable number of melanoma cells, um, and we counted them and we had a lovely clean sample, which we then ran very hurriedly up to um, the, um, Auckland Genomics and rather shakily handed them over to Liam at the time, um, who prepared two single cell libraries for us. Um, these libraries were then shipped to Macrogen for sequencing. 
Um, and we got back some really beautiful data. And I will hand it over now to Joanna um, to continue the story. <laughs> thank you, Alicia. Uh, and thank you for um, inviting us to speak today. Um, I, I would just like, uh, we could go to the next slide. Uh, to acknowledge Klaus because he uh, did all the key bioinformatics analyses for this project. Um, so I'm going over some of the data that, that he's prepared for that. And then there's a little bit that I did downstream after that as well. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So uh, as Alicia mentioned, we prepared two libraries. Um, and interestingly, they, ca they came from the same sample of sorted cells, but done sequentially in serial. And the two libraries ended up representing quite different numbers of cells. So you can see on the left, there were about 4,000 cells. And on, on the right, the second library, there are a little over 6,000 cells. I, we found this a bit curious, and I, I suppose it's a bit of a, a technical tip that cell types like melanoma that are, have huge cells clearly are maybe settling or something during the, the procedure of preparing the, the um, isolating the single cells into the droplets. Uh, we weren't quite sure why this happened, but the data quality was still good. So we went through and analyzed both libraries. And what you can see here is generating the UMAP that um, Klaus was able to come up with like match the analogous clusters where we had 13 clusters uh, in the library on the left and 12 clusters in the library on the right. When we went through and then analyzed the gene expression. So look, for example, the next slide, um, you can go through and look at melanocyte markers. So melanoma is a cancer that is derived from melanocytes. Those are the pigmented cells in your skin. So there are a number of genes that are only expressed by those. Um, for example, here, you know, uh, genes that are involved in making the melanocytes the pigment, uh, and they are expressed or highly represented in that larger cluster, the lower left. There were small outlying clusters um, from the analysis, and we could go through and through looking at the gene expression, we could identify what they were as well. So for example, the top panels, by one is uh, also known as CD90, so it's a marker of fibroblasts and stromal cells. So there's a contaminant of that from our sorting. And then you can see on the, the lower, the CD45 is a marker of immune cells. So we also had a, a small contaminant of immune cells, which, you know, if we dig deeper into the gene expression, we could identify some clusters of like B cells and T cells. But by and large, we had enriched with the melanoma cells. Um, and there were another, a number of other interesting features that we could analyze within those melanoma cells. For example, this is a set of markers that tend to um, indicate invasive cancer cells. So those, if you think of a large tumor mass, the cells that are on the edge of it can be um, having a different gene expression where they're really showing invasive types of proteins or enzymes that will allow it to penetrate into the normal tissue. So you can see here um, in cluster eight, those genes are appear to be upregulated. Uh, other things that we investigated as well were markers of proliferation um, and cell cycle. So interestingly, there were, you know, the clusters also appeared to segregate by which portion of the cell cycle they were in. So we could see clusters uh, three and four expressing higher levels of genes of S phase, um, whereas cluster seven really had a signature of a G2 to M transition. You can also note that there are many clusters of, of cells that don't, aren't really highly expressing either one of these. And that was consistent with the other findings we've had in terms of looking by immunofluorescence at tissue sections, where there really were only a small proportion of cells that appeared to be active in the cell cycle. Um, and also when we were trying to grow out cell lines, so taking a single cell suspension, putting them into culture to try to establish cell line, um, it was very clear that the, the tumor really had a large proportion of non-proliferative cells in it. Um, there are various other features you could find as well, but as we mentioned, the, the, one of the main objectives of this project was to discover neoepitopes that we could utilize to develop a personalized uh, immunotherapy for the patient. Um, and as Alicia mentioned, you know, we did take uh, two sections to do bulk sequencing for RNA-seq, whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing, uh, but when we were collecting the samples, um, we hadn't yet analyzed them. And so as it turns out, when there was only 10% tumor cells, it became quite difficult to accurately predict mutations that were associated with the tumor. And because we'd done the single cell sequencing, that gave another opportunity where we could really identify um, the tumor associated mutations because we pre-sorted the cells. We ultimately had 451 tumor specific mutations that 
We identified or close identified with confidence in 423 genes, and 381 of these were predicted by algorithms to bind into those MHC uh, receptor molecules where those mutations might actually be presented to the immune system to be able to select for cancer specific T cells. Um, so we wanted to select a subset of those, 381 is way too many to test experimentally. Um, and so we came up with a flowchart of criteria for our initial selection. So first of all, that they would be predicted to bind with a reasonable affinity, which we just defined as less than 500 nanomole or binding affinity. We also wanted mutations that were highly expressed all across all of the single cell clusters. As Alicia mentioned, um, you want a, a mutation that's represented in all the tumor cells. So when you get an immune response, it kills off the entire tumor and you don't have um, portions of the tumor that escape immune attack and then can lead to a recurrence of the cancer. We also wanted uh, mutations that would not be represented uh, in other proteins so that your immune therapy didn't inadvertently attack normal tissues. Um, and we were looking at mutations that were either in the, the anchor positions or the bulge positions, because we felt those would have the, the greatest likelihood of creating specific T cell responses. Um, and then obviously substantial changes in amino acid, um, large binding affinity differences. So uh, using those criteria, we picked 10 mutant peptides from seven different proteins. Those are shown in the table on the right. And the letters in the red are the mutations. Um, and in order to validate whether or not these would actually bind into the MHC, we used a experimental system, which is a TAP2 negative T cell line. So if we go to the, the next slide, the concept of the way this uh, system works is that, as Alicia mentioned, the peptides usually bind into an MHC molecule. And that happens in the cell through a, a facilitated through a protein referred to as TAP which transfers peptides that have been digested in the cytosol uh, into the ER where they get loaded into the MHC molecule uh, prior to um, exiting for cell surface expression. Now in the T2, in the cell line, which is deficient in the TAP protein, it doesn't naturally load peptides into the MHC molecule. And the, as a consequence, the MHC molecule is quite destabilized. And so it cycles off of the surface of the cell and there's very little MHC uh, exposed on the surface of the cell. But if you incubate those cells with synthetic peptides, the synthetic peptides will actually bind into the empty MHC molecules and then stabilize the surface expression of that protein, uh, which means that you can, you can detect and measure binding affinity of the various different peptides by assaying how much of the MHC receptor protein is stabilized on the surface of the cell using flow cytometry. Um, so as proof of principle, uh, there is a, a well-known tumor-associated uh, cancer testes antigen referred to as NYESO1. And the wild-type version of this uh, of a peptide from this protein does not bind into the MHC very well, whereas in a mutant version, where you can see that the, the final cysteine is replaced with a valine residue, that's one of those anchor positions. And so now the mutant peptide actually bends quite well to the MHC molecule. So you can see on the top left, the mutant peptide um, in a dose, dose response fashion will increase the amount of MHC molecule that is on the surface of the cells as detected by flow cytometry. So in increasing fluorescence this increased amount of protein. And you can take the median fluorescence intensity of those and actually generate dose response curves as shown on the right and calculate a, a representative binding affinity. As you can see here is kind of the context of what we were hoping to find in neoantigens, where there is a, a mutant peptide that bound very well, whereas the wild type peptide was absent. You can see among the, the 10 mutant peptides that we chose, five of the mutant peptides uh, bound well to the MHC above background, uh, and only the one of the one of the wild type peptides um, actually bound, and that was one, like, one of the ones I think where we changed maybe um, one of the internal residues and not one of the anchor residues. But now that we, you know, we using all of our bioinformatics algorithms um, in our triage, we were actually able to identify uh, five mutant peptides that appear to be able to be bound by the MHC, which means we could use those now to generate specific T cells through our expansion protocol in culture. 
And so that, that's our next step to be able to take those five sets of peptides and expand reactive T cells and then test to make sure that um, the, for the, the four on the right, for example, that you are getting enrichment for mutant selective T cell clones that aren't gonna cross react with the wild type because that would make sort of an ideal situation we're talking about having a therapeutic that you'd want to infuse back into the patient. So that was one way to use it. Now, another way that we ended up using our single cell RNA-seq data was part of the process of developing that T cell line is that we'd want to be able to validate that those T cells could actually kill tumor cells expressing the mutant peptides. So it's ideal to be able to generate a autologous melanoma cell line by taking bits of the tumor and growing it out in culture. Now, sometimes the melanoma cells do not adapt to culture very well. And so in order to help us identify possible cell culture methods, we use the RNA-seq data um, to inform the culture conditions. So in, in the next slide specifically, we were looking at expression of various growth factor receptors that could help us to choose which growth factors to put into the media. And then we also looked at the expression of various types of integrins because frequently when you put the tumors into culture, they like to have something like a collagen or a basement membrane on the bottom because they're not going to attach or grow very well just onto the plain plastic tissue culture dish. Uh, and so we, we could use a single cell data to see which were the most frequently expressed um, growth factors and in integrins among the various cell lines and then come up with a few combinations of targeted cell culture conditions to try to enhance the success rate of us developing a tumor cell line. Um, and so those were the key ways that we ended up using the single cell data to help with our, our larger cell therapy program. So really, you know, utilizing that single cell RNA-seq to empower the development of a personalized cancer immunotherapy because it's, the single cell data gives such a, a great depth of information um, that you can't get from the bulk sequencing because you can really see the heterogeneity among all the cancer cells. Um, and so through this, we could characterize cancer cell hundred heterogeneity. So we learned a lot more about the tumor cells themselves in terms of proportions of, you know, for example, invasive cells versus proliferative cells. Uh, we were also able to identify um, mutations that were associated with the cancer cells and also further to be able to identify ones that were widely expressed among all the different tumor cells, sub subsets, to make sure that we were choosing the most optimal neoantigen to develop an immunotherapeutic. Um, and using single cell data also helped us to uh, preemptively choose a subset of cell culture conditions to increase the possibility of us being able to establish uh, a tumor cell line to use for the analysis of our T cell clones. Um, so that, that's the summary of what we did. And there are lots of people that helped with this project. Um, Auckland Genomics was key in, in doing the single cell seek and really utilizing their expertise is a great help to us because they know how to do all the genomics and preparing the libraries and things like that. Um, Klaus is definitely a key asset to do all our fancy bioinformatics and came up with just so many really interesting analyses um, and ways to compare all the various different peptides. Uh, the whole Dunbar lab has been very helpful with all their expertise in the flow cytometry and the sorting and also in the tissue imaging. So, um, uh, Dr. Sam Clark has, has made major advances in doing very high multiplex tissue imaging to help us understand the tissues better. And we really are very grateful to, the, to our patients who have been very generous in donating their tissue. I mean, a particular patient we're studying here and has been helping our group for many years. Um, and a lot of the funding has come through philanthropic sources that we've uh, utilized at the Auckland University. And we're very thankful to them as well. I just want to add my thanks as well and just a little tiny last minute plug um i'm involved in this really lovely charity called cure our ovarian cancer um and we're looking for any sort of partnership with either academic or um commercial so if you want to get involved just get in touch with me and we can talk through ways we can um do some stuff thanks questions i guess Yeah, thank you. That was awesome. Um, yeah, I'll let everyone ask questions. So just, I reckon just unmute yourself and ask them. I think that's the best. I have a question. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Joanna, yeah. the, um, when you're talking about the, the neoantigen uh, um, difference in, um, I think it was expression of, of MHC on the surface of the cell, right? Looking at the different various bindings of the neoantigen versus the wild type antigen. Yeah. Um, that that wild type antigen, would you expect it to have a representative population of T cells that respond to it? Like in as, as a baseline? Yeah. And, so, it, and it, if, um, if that was yeah. sorry, that just before you go, would that would that be an expansion or would it be a priming basically basing on the yeah, so um, I mean, that is somewhat of a complex question, and you know, I can give my view, and Alicia has her own details. Um, during the development of the immune system, proteins, you know, the wild type proteins that are expressed in normal tissues will develop tolerance. So either the, the reactive T cell lineages will be deleted or they'll be suppressed. So, it, in general, you wouldn't expect um, an immune response to be launched against a, a well-exposed wild-type peptide. Um, so that, that actually helps, so like in, in the sense that if there are T cell clones that would identify those wild-type peptides, they probably aren't going to expand because they've, they've either been eliminated or they've essentially been shut off um, by central tolerance. We also went the extra step of really focusing in on peptides where the, in the wild type, they wouldn't find it at all. So they never would have been presented. So there wouldn't be, there'd be a lower chance of actually having a cross-reactive T cell clone because that peptide has not been expressed on the surface of the cell. So the mutant peptide would, would be binding uniquely and it really would be much more of a unique uh, peptide sequence to select for a T cell clone. You have anything to add, Alicia? Um, no, other than we were you meaning that um, the response to the neoantigen would be prim new priming or or were you just talking in, in regards to against the healthy tissue? In response to the neoantigen, because like the, the word with the word being used was expansion. So I was just curious if you were thinking that the um there was like a population of responders already present that you were going to make larger, or if you were looking at developing a new a new response right. from naive, from naive. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, ideally we're targeting a naive response because we have more control over that. Um, the cells have more replicative potential um, and, and in our hands, we have good reliable protocols for expanding cells um, to have an N phenotype that's desirable. But in reality, it could be a mix of both. There's, there's evidence that you can pick up neoantigens, uh, sorry, uh, T cells that are targeted towards a tumor neoantigen in the peripheral. Um, and, and there are some groups who are specifically targeting those already expanded cells and then expanding them further. So I imagine that the end product will be a mix of the two. Um, I, was just, I was just going to ask where you see this going, you know, eventually when it becomes a clinical thing. Is this going to be a case of you sequence every person and there's a magic pipeline and then you make the peptides? Or are you kind of hoping there'll be a, you know, library of a couple of hundred that you can start there rather than having to go all the way back to the genomics for every patient? I think initially it's going to have to be bespoke um, every time sequencing, and and this has been one of the the sort of key things that has progressed, which has allowed us to do this, is that whole genome sequencing is so much more accessible nowadays. Um, and in terms of peptide synthesis, that I mean that's that's another point which is reasonably slow, but. Um, we're partnering up with chemistry um, and, and they have some fancy ways of making peptides very quickly. And that's currently just been established for GMP manufacturing. Um, but I think 
as time progresses and, and this is done more frequently, we will end up with a pool of um, frequently mutated epitopes, which we could then go on to do more off the shelf products. And I think, you know, ultimately that, that would be the most cost effective way to do it. Um, but this is, this is still pretty new in terms of um, pipelines and clinical efficacy and the whole lot. Joanna? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, to begin with, it, it needs to be started on a per patient basis, but it'd be the sort of thing where you essentially build a library um, of those peptides. And so, you know, you'd build the library, build the information base. So as you came across the same mutations and other patients, you'd already have validated some of them, which would just increase the speed um, with which you could do it. Really, and I'd say you know, in terms of the, the therapeutic approach that we'd start with, uh, there are already a lot of known tumor-associated antigens, and and so the, the concept that we'd started with is you know you do the sequencing, and already we're probably going to identify known tumor-associated antigens, and so you could start with the first round of immunotherapy by expanding T cells for those known ones, while at the same time working on. Um, novel discovery of new new antigens for that patient so that you could have a second line of therapy coming on after that. Great, was there any more questions? Ravanji. If you can generate a library of you know, your potential neoantigens that you validated work well in terms of MHC binding and reactivity. Do you think it would be possible to generate um, like a series of hybridoma lines to generate antibodies against those specific mutant peptides? So you could actually do screening based off imaging from tissue slices immediately? Yeah, I mean, in principle, that could work. I mean, you could you take that a step further as well and make therapeutic antibodies for once you raise antibodies from it if it really were effective. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that could help. I think the, the um, in situ techniques, looking at the, the nucleic acids as well is really improved from where it used to be as well. So you may not actually have to go through the extent of raising specific antibodies to it because it does take the time of creating the antibodies and validating that they're specific. Um, I think you can start going into the plague acid probes as well. I have, an, I have another question, if nobody minds. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the kind of concept of stimulating the immune system to um, target what are effectively self antigens, even if they're not normally visible to the immune system, um, seems like it it carries a whole bunch of inherent risks around development of autoimmune uh, responses. Uh, and I was wondering um, how deep do you think you would need to go into like not tumor tissue? So, so you've, you've got the, the, the sort of the, the, lymph, the lymph node and tumor tissue type sequencing. How deep would you need to go into other tissues in the body? looking for these same peptides and expression in different contexts where it is um, expressed the same peptide for whatever reason or, or similar enough peptide um, is for whatever reason expressed in a different context. Is that, a, is that a big concern or is it something that you're not not too worried about? Well, it is, it is certainly a concern. Um, I think, you know, the fact that the, just the plethora of genomic data that we have now, there are already a lot of databases and researches where you could probably search through to determine whether or not those peptide sequences existed anywhere else. But it is most certainly something that you want to do is due diligence. I mean, like, you know, we're looking at neoactotes, but there are other groups that, for example, have um, engineered highly reactive T-cell clones to some of the, the mage proteins and have horrible... Um, off-target effects because, for example, they didn't notice that it, there were homologous proteins that had the same uh, epitope in cardiac tissue or in brain tissue. And so there have, there have been some human clinical trials that have had some rather disastrous results because people didn't do their due diligence. I mean, for us, we most certainly would do that um, to check to the extent that, that we could. There are, in addition, some of the other groups that have started doing these, um, these types of T-cell expansions 
more focused on tumor, known tumor associated antigens, but there are ways to take the patient's cells and just make blasts look for self-reactive to make sure it's not having self-reactive cells, uh, self-reactive activity against, for example, PHA blasts of PDMC. Um, but yeah, I, it is it is a risk, but people have have done it even against the cancer testis antigens, which are going to have some low level of expression even in the normal body. So, so your 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 opinion is that it's a existing database issue, a, a sort of solution, rather than having to do the same sort of bespoke sequencing that you do on the tumor. Well, we use the PBMC to do genomic sequencing, right? So we'll know what the, the patient's unique genomic um, context is. So independent of what the actual expression level is across tissues, we would know what their inherent genome is throughout their entire body, their somatic genome. So they, I mean, in that sense, it doesn't, ideally this kind of sequence would actually go from the tumor genome DNA and the PBMC DNA to really, I think, pin down the genetic differences. We ended up using RNA, the single cell RNA-seq data just because of some extenuating circumstances in our samples. Just pausing because every time I've gone before, someone's talked. <laughs> so it's just mm -hmm. giving it an extra minute. Um, any more questions from anyone? I think there might be it. Um, if any, should I do one more quiz one? I don't think anyone's really enjoying the quiz, but um, if anyone wants one of the prizes, just uh, feel free to type in the box um, what the recommended cell viability is for the workflow, what percent. <laughs> oh, yeah, far out. <laughs> That was quick. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's right. Um, I'll flick um, yes. you and Ash an email. <laughs> uh, yeah, or let me know whether you want the socks or the couch or t shirt So, yeah, I'll flick you some info. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, this has been awesome. Um, yeah, and thank you so much um, to Nikki and Yvonne, but especially to Joanna and Alicia. That was, yeah, really amazing work. So important and uh, really nice too to see where you're up to with it. Um, yeah, yes, clap, clap, clap. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, if anyone has any um, questions for me or Yvonne, just let us know. We have a lot of um, Zoom meetings with people just talking about their sample types and what they can do and what the options are. Um, don't be afraid. It doesn't have to be, you know, it can just be 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Um, we have lots of chats all the time, so feel free to let us know. Um, obviously, um, get in touch with Nikki at Auckland Genomics too if you want. And yeah, um, thank you again. Hey, Yvonne, have you got anything to add? Sorry, before I... No, look, uh, it was very uh, impressive data, you know, so thanks for sharing that, or, you know, your considerations, your thinking process, and, and the next steps, I guess, that you've planned. So, uh, you know, I was thinking, uh, Elena and I would certainly like to catch up with you separately, if that's okay, with sort of some of the products that are in the pipeline, like our Beam and our Xenium in situ technology that potentially, you know, could, could help with the next steps that you mentioned. So just to give you a bit more detail on that, uh, if, you, if you're interested. So otherwise, hey, fantastic. And thanks so much for, yeah, for, for being here today. Yeah. Thank you. And um, we are going to continue this series. So um, yeah, not in two weeks, but we're hoping we'll have one uh, maybe specifically on Visium soon. So we'll keep you all updated. Yeah, with some more of Sam's work. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. That was so interesting, you guys. I thought it was such a good talk. Both of you did such a nice job. Thanks. Yeah, it was fantastic. Thank really you. Really interesting to see how far it's progressed and just how much work it's a huge amount it looks like a huge amount of work has gone into this <laughs> yeah it's, incidentally uh the uh, biospherics engineers are hopefully coming in may so you know fingers crossed that's so exciting I'm still still confirming but yeah that's the that's the current plan oh uh, wow that's that's and we're gonna get we're gonna get dangerous. we're gonna get air pro the precision here the people who do all the hood servicing we're gonna get them trained up at the same time to service the the cabinet locally so i'm really hoping that it will just become so much easier and more proof to against sudden border border closures <laughs> just i don't know if people are familiar the biospherics is the unit that we can grow um therapeutic cell mm -hmm. processing for actual patient treatment right so you need sort of almost like a gmp style 
It's it is yeah. it will exactly be a GMP. Uh, that's what it's being set up for. We we managed to get it get through most of two test runs before the lockdown first lockdown happened early 2020. Yeah. So yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. Really neat to see too if it's possible once you collect a huge library of these to see if there's more of a generic sort of immunotherapy that you could, you know, which would make it a lot yeah. less expensive. And yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks heaps again, ladies. It was awesome. Yeah.